Yes. Okay, here we go. So it's recording, I believe. All right, so welcome everybody to the military support table talk session number one. So all of us here are military spouses. My name is Martina Dreyer, and my wife is in the Army National Guard. I'm Erica Kenner, and my husband is in a regular Army Army officer. And my name is Mallory Herrera, and my husband is a regular Army Army officer. <laughs> Awesome. So we put this together because we figured that having a nice support session and a support environment um, for you guys would be very helpful. And we did put a, together a little outline of common questions and things like that we do, that we do receive as spouses. So one thing we wanted to go over are some typical rules as a spouse to know. One of those is, so one of them is PDA, which my husband is super... Um, strict about this one I would say and it was one of the ones that caught me off guard and it used to be like you know I honestly thought that you just don't want to show me love but it really is a thing so PDA um, you're not supposed to kiss hug hold hands and that sort of thing while they're in uniform because it's just it's not professional despite how many pictures you may see after World War II coming back from deployment and people kissing of course those are different coming back from deployment but for the most part, just going to the store or going up and down the post or wherever you are, like in a park, if they're in uniform, they're normally not supposed to be kissing, hugging, or holding hands. Mallory? Another one that's really common is that any an officer or me, a soldier in his uniform cannot put their hands in the pockets. Um, and I always thought that that was the weirdest thing because my husband would not be able to put his hands in his pockets to pull out the key to his car, <laughs> especially while walking, heaven forbid you're walking. Right? <laughs> so you get a lot of hands on hips when they're standing right, even if they're yeah. not, you know, they have their hands on their hips or their hands crossed. Right? <laughs> um, another thing is they, a uh, soldier always has to keep their right hand empty because they have to be able to salute. So as a spouse, just be um, familiar with and uh, get into the habit of walking on the left hand side of your soldier so they can have that hand free to be able to spin. Um, another thing is they are very specific on what you can and cannot do while you are walking in uniform and that pretty much means that the only thing you're allowed to do is walk. <laughs> no eating, no drinking, no talking on your phone, definitely no texting. You have anything in your hands, you can be looking down, and anything that looks in any way disrespectful to the uniform that your shoulders wear. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and the last one is that um, just know for us spouses, because I learned this the hard way, we cannot wear our soldier or our spouse's uniform at all. I, I learned that the hard way. That includes PTs, <laughs> because that's what I did. <laughs> um, just know that a soldier works very hard um, to earn every uniform that they wear. So out of respect, we do not wear any of their uniform. And if it's an accident, they understand, but <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, here are so, some of the common acronyms <clears throat> that you're going to hear a lot as a military spouse. Is One of them is probably um, OPSEC, and that stands for the Operational Security which applies to like your social media posts or anything that is military operations related. related. So be very vigilant on what you post or you set, okay? Um, it is a rule that is punishable to us civilians and us spouses. So if you don't know whether or not you should post something, ask your soldier whether or not you should be doing that. It's very crucial to know. Don't do it, don't know you can do it, okay? Um, NCO stands for non-commissioned officer. Tracking, you'll hear tracking. That means that the soldier understands or they will comply um, or they're following up on like, a task. Uh, Roger kind of means like they comprehend. Um, rack out means that they're going to go to bed. Uh, chow means food. Um, typically when you find the food, it's either in the mess hall or what would you love you are called the, uh, the DVAC, so it's the dining facility. <laughs> uh, you'll hear MEPS a lot, um, which stands for Military Entrance Processing Station. 
And that's where service members take their ASVAB test, they get a physical, and they choose their military job and are sworn in. Um, MOS um, is Military Occupational Specialty. Um, this is a service member's specific job in the military. Um, it can be from artillery to aviation to engineering and intelligence. And normally you won't even know what they're talking about no. when they say, well, what's your MOS? Because then it'll be like Mike 42, and you're like, what? What is that <laughs> F? 20, I'm just making up numbers and letters at this point in time, but honestly, that's that they, that's what they say. I, I know some of them, but I still, I mean, there's certain ones for truckers, there's certain ones for infantrymen, there's certain ones oh, for artillery, yes. and so even when they say that, they'll start talking in a completely different language, but know that MOS, and when they're starting to say the letters and the numbers, that relates to what actual MOS they are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, DOD, there we go. So DOD is Department of Defense, um, Department of the U.S. Government responsible for military operations. So a lot of times you'll hear DOD ID, which is your Department of Defense ID. Um, normally our cards are not, sometimes you refer to them DOD ID, but their cards are normally referred to as CAC cards, C-A-C, CAC cards. Um, and that's what they use to put in their computers in order to be able to turn them on. Yes. Your DOD ID, though, is more important than your driver's license. Have that thing on you anywhere that you go. You, you can't shop in the commissary. No. You can't, can't, yes. no, you can't, can't do get on post. anything yeah. without that. And know that you can drive in the lane. DOD <laughs> lane. I didn't know that forever, and I was waiting in the other lane. So if you're going to the United States Military Academy or any post, and you're, there's a DOD lane, and you've got a military ID, you can drive in that lane, because I didn't know that. <laughs> I like TSA pre -check. Yeah. Um, you'll hear them say like, Whoa! I hope I did that right. Well, That's like the army call, okay? Every branch has different ones, but for the army, it's Whoa! <laughs> uh, Mallory? Oh, oh sorry. That's okay. um, so PTS is another very popular one. It stands for um, permanent change of station. So you, depending on how long your service member is going to be in, you could end up doing this um, I, my husband and I have PCS three times in the last five years, um, so it just, you know, it gets, it gets a little crazy, but, you know, just kind of make a game out of it. Embrace the suck <laughs> yeah. is our family motto at this point. <laughs> Find an adventure in everywhere you go, same yes. year, we, we, we PCS three times in one year as well, and it was because he was going from one place to a school to another something, so sometimes when they're going to schools, they're only a year long, so yeah, he'll less than a year, so you'll move from one place to another, and it's, it's a little ridiculous sometimes, but embrace the suck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So Erica, you want to talk to them about the different uniforms in reference, it's, is that more towards the United States Military Academy? No, that's or no. All of them. So the United States Military Academy has their, they have a completely different set of uniforms. They have India White's parade uniform uh, as for class, white of a gray, they have their own set of uniforms, however, um, but that's for the cadets. That's just for, for the cadets. cadets. Yeah. However, once you are in the army, um, or once the cadets become officers, and as well as um, enlisted, it's the same, uh, you have your ASUAs, ASUBs, your PTs, and your OCPs, and you formally have your ACUs. So, what is that? So your ASUAs are the very formal ones. It's the jacket, it's the long sleeve um, jacket with all of their ribbons. Um, that's pretty standard. ASUBs is a little bit different because ASUBs can be the short sleeves or they can be the long sleeve, but it's just the shirt, it's not the jacket. Um, and ASUBs can be with or without medals or they can be told how many medals they're supposed to have on that day, so that kind of changes as well. Um, OCPs, OCP is actually an, an acronym within an acronym, <laughs> and I'm trying to, it's Operation Enduring Freedom. I don't remember. Somebody, it's, yeah. it's Google it. Yeah, yeah. It's the new one that they're wearing now. The one. the one with the um the cam the different kind of camouflage. The digital or the tied, floral one. Or yeah, the, the, the digital tied camouflage are your a ACUs, um, which is the Army Combat uniform. Army Combat uniform, right? And then you have your PTs, which are your um, so it's workout. Yeah, the workout uniform. <laughs> And they all have special hats. Yeah. Just wait until you. It's a Stetson, not a cowboy hat. I 
wait until you get your, your spouse that says, oh, I need to go and shave my beret. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. a whole process. Yeah, you have to shave and shave. And apparently, you can buy molded berets online. So tell your service member you can buy a molded beret already. <laughs> don't know what that means and don't know how special that is, but he's really excited. Does anybody else find it comical when, they're, when watching their spouse like get ready? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> He's yeah. got the ruler out, and they're like, yeah, they're out, they're trying to measure. Oh, yeah. They're like, where's this? Wait, I need this to <laughs> And you're just watching. You're like, oh, no. I'm like, man, it takes you longer to get ready. Right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Be, be prepared for that. You will be ready before them. Yeah. <laughs> um, what other terms? We got deers, right? So, yeah. So that is the system where basically all of your information goes into your internet. Um, your life insurance as well, or your husband's life insurance as well as um, any sort of medical, if you're in the tier system that you have medical benefits. That's that. Yeah, yeah. Basically, that's that's that pretty much kind of wraps that up. It's the make sure that you know how to get into your deers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what deers is because if you ever have more children or a child or anything like that, you need to know those steps to take to add them to. Absolutely. So always have your know your soldier's social security number. Memorize it. Memorize it. <laughs> Memorize it. Know it better than your own. Yes. Because you don't know you it better need than it a lot. That's the only one you really use. Yep. 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 Um, speaking of different programs and systems and paperwork and stuff, they don't need LES. You'll hear a lot, and a lot of um, apartments or whatever around military posts, posts around military posts will use the term LES, and that's leave an earnings statement. And that basically just shows how much your um, soldier gets paid. Um, and so you use that in order to kind of proof of income. Um, and that's a good way to normally get into an apartment because they're always looking to rent to uh, soldiers because they know that they get BAH, which BAH stands for Base Housing Allowance, yes. which is what you receive depending on if you have, if you're married, well, I guess you your spouse. Um, there's a dependent category, and there is a, um, for single soldiers, there's a different um, amount, and you get paid a certain amount of BAH, base housing allowance, um, you get paid a certain amount based on your rank and based on whether or not you have dependents, and that's something that you can Google, so just Google BAH and then whatever your zip code that you are actually PCSing to. Important to know that you should use the zip code that you're PCSing to and not the zip code that you are planning on moving to. For example, we're PCSing to Fort Leavenworth, but we're going to be living in Kansas City, Missouri, and it very well could be different. If you're living at West Point you and you put in the zip code for a place around West Point, that's going to be much, much different than a place at, in New York City. Um, the amount changes drastically, even within miles mm -hmm. of so yeah. we always use the zip code where that's on your orders yes yes and, mm -hmm. and anytime you're a PCSA have like five copies of the orders mm -hmm. available at all times everybody will want to see them everybody wants them mm -hmm. you need to know all of that information you, you'll get an RFO prior to getting orders and that's a request for orders and that's that's how you know it's coming <laughs> yeah, yeah, you so you start yeah. that process. Yeah. 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 Uh, what about FRG? What is that? So that is the Family Readiness Group is what oh. that is. So that is um, kind of the other spouses on post is typically kind of like run those, those things. Um, it's generally, um, depending on the size of the unit that your spouse may be in, it's the highest ranking officer's wife that's typically running the FRG for your, your group or even for the entire post, depending on the size of it. Um, but they kind of are running all of the, the family events. It's the looking out for the spouses who may be going through deployment, it's looking out for spouses who have young children that need help with different things, it's putting together community events, um, things along those lines. Um, I did find out early on though that apparently we were not attending all of the FRG meetings could look bad on my husband. Oh. So they are very big on those little things <laughs> like that. So. And they're different, they're different levels. Wow. I mean, you, there have are. A, you have a company, so 
the different levels of your, uh, I guess, the unit that you're with. You have platoon, company, battalion, brigade, division. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have a division at large. I don't think they do either. But they definitely have brigade, battalion, and company level at large base. And so normally it is going to be either the senior level commissioned officer's spouse or the senior level NCO spouse that will run those um, different FRGs, which they tend to get a bad rap, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes yeah. FRGs tend to get a bad rap that are um, that they're clickish or um, something like that. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, for women, a lot of times it's, it's women, <laughs> and, and, and there's so many different personalities. <laughs> and, and, and if you think about it, though, there are so many different personalities, <laughs> and being a military spouse, you have to have a certain level of strength, yes. and so many personalities with so much strength all in one organization. You can see how that can get a little bit... Um, we're all strong, and so we all sometimes tend to, instead of being strong with each other, tend to be strong towards each other. But if you remember that it's about being strong with each other and not necessarily towards each other, then you're going to be successful. That's yeah. a great way of putting that. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> that leads us to the difference in terms, which you had just uh, talked about the platoon, the, what is it? The platoon, company, battalion, brigade, division. Yes. And um, I don't know if you want to, did you go into the about so each, each one is kind of, so normally a, a post will have a division, um, and then that'll be made up of, I'm not even sure, four or five brigades, I'd say, and then the brigades are made up of battalions, the battalions are made up of companies, and the companies are made up of platoons. I still don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how about a post? What's a post? So post is an army installation, so army has post, navy has bases, big Different. <laughs> Don't say that. I came from a Navy family, so, my, so I kept calling it a base for a long time. It's not a base. 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 And then you might hear uh, an armory. So an armory, um, it's actually a very important part of the military's assets um, because it does store arms and equipment and is also sometimes a place where soldiers are trained to use them. So another way to use this would be um, to refer to like, uh, you might hear them say stockpile or a stash of non-military goods. So that's an armory. So some um, soldiers do actually work out of an armory. My wife is one. So, um, so some typical questions that I'm gonna have Mallory and Erica talk about this. These deal with more um, with West Point. Um, so how is it living on hopes? <laughs> um, so this is actually the first time that my husband and I have ever lived on post. We've always done off-post housing before, but just with where West Point itself is located, we just determined that that would be better for our family to stay here on post. Um, there are definitely some benefits, such as you know the easy access to the commissary and the PX is great. Um, not having to worry about going across the mountain when it's snowing is right. also really nice. <laughs> you do have things like, you know, max speed limit anywhere on post is 25 miles an hour, and those MPs are serious. Woo, they're serious. They do not allow speeding anywhere. Yeah. Anywhere. You will get busted and ripped the ticket very, very quickly. And they don't care. You can no. have military ID all you want. They and, they, and if you get busted too many times, I don't know what the rule is here, but typically it's like two or three times you get busted speeding, they will take your your driving privileges on post. Even if they don't take your driver's license and suspend Ooh. that, they can suspend your driving privileges on a post. Oh so goodness. that is an important thing to remember. If they do not like your driving tactics, <laughs> you do not want to get get stuck not being able to drive to your house. <laughs> right. So. And your ticket is not a county ticket. No. It's not a city ticket. It's a federal ticket. Yes. It's yes. a federal property. Ooh. Yes, you are on federal property. Anything down here is against the federal government. You must be careful with anything. <laughs> um, there's also kind of all the different, you know, little rules and regulations about, you know, your housing and stuff. Um, if you, it's basically like a really big HOA. It's <laughs> kind of how that works. They have they have rules about, you know, things like, uh, you know, how long your grass is allowed to be, and you know, things that you're you are and are not allowed to have. 
how they move on and stuff like that. And if you were having to, you know, break any of those rules, you know, this paper is called a chip. <laughs> so <laughs> they're, they're not wow. they're not as strict here that I've I've noticed, which is really nice. Um, but some other posts can be, so I would kind of be aware of those kind of things, especially if you decide to live on post. Find out what those rules are. Find out if you be in charge of your own lawn care, if you know, they don't if they don't allow you to have a stroller sitting on the front porch. You know, some oh. some places are very strict on stuff like that. Um, so kind of keeping those things in mind is good to know. Um, uh, then also living on post you have to deal with the all of the all of the horns sounding at all different yes. times of the day. Um, because they always sound sound the bugle and do the cannons and stuff to wake the day basically. The yep, the reveling and the retreat. They have all of that going on. There is there are different horns that sound for different times of the day and it is really important that you kind of pay attention to what those are. It's if you are on post at five o'clock and you hear the horn, you must stop whatever it is that you were doing and turn towards the closest flag that you can find and stand with your your hand across your car. You have to do it even if you were driving your car and you stop your car and get out. Yep. It is the rule. <laughs> you are civilian. I think that there is an exception though. If you have a child in your car, yeah, you're allowed to stay in your car but you shouldn't be driving it. I also heard the other day, not sure if this is true, um, <laughs> that it is um, that if you're above the flag, so like if you're going up the hill towards okay. Stony, uh -huh. and you're above the flag, you don't have to. So oh, oh I wow! Didn't know that. I'm gonna have to look that but you know that. yeah, but I'm not. Like, but I, I think someone told me that the other day is that if you're above the flag, you don't. Stop. Oh wow! Hmm. Listen, that would be a good one to find out. But that would be a good one to find out. Oh yeah, yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not. But I'm. But fact check on that one. Yeah. <laughs> that Just when in doubt, do it. <laughs> yeah, you can hear it. it. Honestly, though, if you can hear it, you should do it. Yeah, yeah you, you should, should do it. it. You should do it. Okay. So now you understand as a civilian what you do. Because I didn't know, and I just followed suit what other mm -hmm. people were doing, and they got out of their car, and I got out of my car, and I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so now you understand. And it will startle you, because if you guys can see my face the first time, <laughs> the cannon blew, when the cannon blew, I, I literally hit the deck. I, I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> Nobody had warned me. I didn't know they'd do that. So now you've been warned. <laughs> what about, um, since we were talking about PSE, what about PSE and job hunting? Something I don't really know about for you guys. So that is, I would say, because my husband and I don't have kids yet, that is probably the number one challenge of a military spouse. My story, and I'm sure you'll tell yours as well. My story, I came, I met my husband as a television reporter in Nashville. I was um, that girl in college who didn't really have time for anything or anybody because I was so focused on my career and this is what I was going to do. And I did, you know, five internships and all I was doing was studying because all I wanted to do was journalism. Um, so to go from that to now, do you continue in journalism where they're asking me to sign for your contracts or do I marry my husband who I love and I know that I can't sign for your contract because the military could up and say, hey, it's time to move and now I can't be with him. Right. So I did end up giving up that journalism career, which was difficult, but I don't know my husband, so whatever. Um, <laughs> and so for a long time, I struggled. I was given the opportunity to go back on news at one of our, um, at when, we, when he was in one school, but we were only there for, Ten months, so I, I went. I kind of tripled back into news, but there were so many secretary jobs that I took. That not that secretary was beneath me, but I felt like, um, gosh, I was just on television the other day, and now you're like, you know, yelling at me, telling me that I better have this paper on your desk by a certain amount. Of, and and sometimes you take those jobs because you need somewhere to go. You need somewhere to leave the house and to still be, it's not even for the money, it's more so just because I need somewhere to go every day, I need to feel like I produced, I produced um, something, and so I, I did take some of those jobs, and then eventually um, I tried to turn my journalism career into like a PR sort of thing, and I got told, well thank your husband so very much for his service, but you're in the military, so you're going to be moving, which means that we can't hire you, which 
really was like the mm -hmm. biggest kick in the face yeah. because it was thank you for your service we're not going to hire you because you're only going to be here for three years but on average these days who stays in a job longer than three years anyway because you have to like start moving in order to get promoted or upper mobility or whatever so um so that was probably the most hurtful thing that i think i've ever dealt with and so after that i turned around and i said okay well i love event planning everyone always told me that i was supposed to event plan in my life that's what i was destined for and so i decided that that was going to be something i was going to do so i went in i did it the right way i went to school um i'm sorry um, <laughs> I went to school, I went back to school for event planning, well, not school, I got my certificate in event planning, and um, I started my own business, but I did the right way, I got licensed and all that, you, like, if you're going to start your own business, do it the right way, get your license, do all the different things that um, take that time to be legitimate, um, get a, a professional website, professional business cards, have an office space, a real office space if you are truly starting your own business, and we ended up doing really well. We did 25 weddings in the first two years, which my mentors were like, I can't get mentors. They, they, they could not believe that um, that we had that many weddings and we were, and it wasn't like I was saying, okay, like, you know, I'll do your wedding for $500. I was charging, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars a wedding. So I was doing pretty well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it wasn't right. And and from there I ended up coming to West Point thinking, okay, well I'm just gonna run my business out here. And things changed and I ended up getting a um, contracting position with the government. Yep. And so sometimes that's how you get your foot in the door if you're yep. looking for a GS job of general scale, general grade, a civilian job which with the DOD. If you're looking for one of those, look for contractor jobs. So I started off, mm -hmm. I got a contractor job where essentially I planned events for the Army. Um, and then from there, I applied for a civilian job or a GS job, and that's what I'm doing now. I do events for cadets at West Point, which is the coolest thing in the whole entire <laughs> world. And my job has actually, um, because they recognize that I'm a spouse, and because they recognize that I love my job, and because they recognize that I'm doing it high level I've developed a big passion for it and I go above and beyond every single day and they're now turning my job into a telework position at least until the end of the year or until I find something else I mean so, so you never know Ooh, so it's you okay. never know like what sort of opportunities come and your journey is going to be um, it's gonna change I mean most spouses that you talk to they'll say Oh yeah, I'm on my third career. Or I'm on my fourth career. <laughs> like, they're always on a different career, yeah. and that doesn't mean that they can't stick with something. It means that like because they were at Fort Bragg, this worked for them at that time. Because they were at this place, this worked for them at, at this particular time. And um, so yeah, so it's just it is an adventure. It is a journey. It is one of the hardest things to deal with if you met your husband as a career person or if you are a very career-minded person and you're like, I'm gonna do this. Like if you met him right out of college and you're like, I'm definitely gonna do this, there's no one stopping me, and then bam, you fall in love with a guy that's in the military that moves every three years or moves three times in one year or, or whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. it is. It is very, very difficult. One of the things of advice that I would say though is it's not being sneaky, but in a interview, you are never obligated. Now a lot of times they can tell based off your resume, um, that you know you moved from one city to another city to another city like what's going on there you're never obligated to say my husband's in the military you can say my husband works for the government and and that's right. a, that's a big deal because then it's like oh you know my husband works for the government and then if they ask further and you don't feel comfortable saying you can say oh you know he just he does some things that you know not not make it like sound I don't know. It sounds sketchy. It sounds sketchy, <laughs> but, like, but uh, you know, he, he, my husband works for the government. And then you can leave it at that, and they should back off, which then you don't have to get into the military and how long you're going to be here and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, that That's a good piece of advice that I would say. Um, but again, a lot of times you can't tell from your resume that mm -hmm. <laughs> you look like a gypsy. <laughs> yeah. so, I've, had that I I've definitely yeah. had that problem with the resume with having too many different jobs listed on there where you will occasionally have future employers that will look at it and be like, oh, this person obviously doesn't have any work ethic because this person is bouncing around can't job after can't job because they can't keep a job. And so I did have to say, no, my husband is in the military. 
but we are going to be here guaranteed X amount of time because this is the particular reason that we're here. You know, and if you can give them a, a full time frame, depending on the type of work that you have, it would be beneficial. Because mm -hmm. um, my kind of coming into this and trying to find jobs and stuff, so I, I met my husband when I was in college, and now I, I went to college a little bit later, um, you know, got into restaurants and kind of worked through restaurants all the way through college and did all that kind of stuff, and then met my husband and we ended up moving before I was able to fully complete it. So it was kind of like one of those things, either I could stay there in college for another year or we could just go ahead and move. So we moved and I was like, oh, I'll just do it one more thing later, you know, five years later.
uh, what do you call it? I was in the, uh, oh, my brain just went pew. Um, <laughs> what do you call it? Corporations. I was, I was in the corporate world for a very long time. Ever since I was like a teenager, when I got into the admin in the corporate world, and it was after I met my wife that I was like, I'm done with the corporate world. It's very different today than it used to be, and I decided I'm done. Everything is so political. I'm over it. So <clears throat> I never had to worry about bouncing around or moving or anything like that because my wife is um, through AGR which is active guard reserve. And um, fortunately, we have that luxury of not having to PCSE every time, which I had mentioned before. So it's a very, um, very tight community. So I've never had to move around like that, never experienced that kind of lifestyle. Um, but I have decided that, okay, I do, I work six jobs and it's my choice because I'm doing things that I love doing before I went to the corporate world, like babysitting. <laughs> I babysit Mallory's little boy, he's so cute. <laughs> and, um, or things that I've always wanted to try. Um, so there's jobs that I got through the USA Jobs, which is a nice resource for civilian spouses um, to go to and look for um, work. And I found mine. One of the jobs is a government contracted position. Mm -hmm. And I work at the uh, West Point Visitor Center as a visitor center assistant. And the other is I work on post, which so I work through I have math, I think is who they are. And I work as a bartender. So I bartend at the first class club. And I've never bartended, and I've always wanted to try it. And I started out at, at a sports bar off post, and I was like, oh no, this is too crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm too old for this. I need order, I need structure, I need something. And then so I got that job. I will tell you this, be prepared that if you're getting those type of jobs, like if it's a contracted position, or especially if it's a position on post, you are going to go through a lot of paperwork to get that job. <laughs> Fingerprints, okay, a physical, I had to do an eye exam, okay? I was like, I'm just bartending mm -hmm. to, uh, to measure my depth, I guess, to make sure I can see you. <laughs> Don't pour those like, drinks too heavy. Right? <laughs> so be prepared. There's a lot of paperwork, and be prepared you're, to wait. You're not going to find out about the job right away. And did There's you have to, with my position, with my first government position, they don't pay you for two weeks. Did they do the same thing with you? Mm -hmm. So for, for my position, they did not pay. You don't get your paycheck. You work for two weeks, or no, you work for two paychecks, and you don't get those two paychecks, which you get paid every other week my position, oh. with the GS position, you get paid every, which is different from math, there's, like, there's right. different categories, there's different categories. Um, but you get, you don't get your first two paychecks, you just keep working and working and working, which is really difficult for some people, but once you leave your job, you get those two, so you're still getting two paychecks after you've left the job. Um, another thing about government jobs, it's like, it's like a nightmare for me because every time I think about what I had to go through to apply for government jobs, there's a couple things on USA Jobs. Use your MWR. Um, go in there and figure out who is the USA Jobs guru because they will help you get the job. Yeah. Essentially, like if you want a GS four, five, or above, like that's uh, some sort of like uh, admin or something along those lines. You have got to do your resume a very, very specific way. Most times in the real world, I would say, your resume is a, a page long or two pages at most. Your resume is 10 pages long for these jobs. I mean, they are ridiculous. Yeah. Like they, and the wording, the way that you word it, very, very specific way that you word it in order to get these jobs. On top of, if your spouse, which I'm guessing this is a spouse too, yep. so you are, uh, you get spousal <laughs> preference spousal preference there's a certain amount of times where that kicks in so if you've been somewhere for a year you no longer have spousal preference anymore it, it only lasts for a year you have to register through certain programs so you can't just click the box when you apply that says I'm a spouse I get spousal preference you have to go in register as a spouse in order to it to for it to show up in their system as yes you are a spouse on top of that they also <laughs> I, 
Let me tell you. Girl! Get on her so much. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> on top of that, you also have to um, have certain, be certain, be coded for certain positions within that spousal preference. So, make sure that you just go in and talk to that. Long story short, if you're a spouse, you have to have your orders, you have to have your ID, you have to have your marriage license. Those are all things yes. that you should always have all the time, like accessible at all times because you need them for everything. Yep. Um, those three things, bring them in. They will walk you through. Ask as many questions as possible. Ask if there's anything that you should be asking that you have not because they should tell you like there are certain codes that right. you should be that you should have on your um, USA Jobs. And the reason why I'm going into USA Jobs so much is because um, it is such a great resource for military spouses to find jobs because there are jobs specifically on there where they're looking for military spouses and there is no, you're going to be here for three years so we don't want to hire you. It's, it's, we love to have military spouses because we know how hard they work. Um, and not only that, but once you gain a certain amount of status within the government system, you're like a sure shot every time you, every time you go to a different post. Like you not only are not our military spouse, so they rank it like veteran military spouse, former GS civilian. So now you have even more like rank to get certain jobs. And a lot of times it has nothing to do with your ability. It has everything to do with your, um, where you rank on the scale of, mm -hmm. are you a veteran? Are you a military spouse? Are you a GS employee already? Are you this? Are you that? So that's my recommendation. Do you guys ever find it hard? Like one of the things that I feel that is needed more, especially for us military spouses, is I feel like we need more understanding like managers or people that run the company. Okay, because I'm not gonna lie, I'm late a lot to work, but people don't understand the nightlife of a military spouse. Okay? People don't understand that you might be up with your spouse until one or two in the morning helping them finish their work, especially if they're in a position where they're on call 24-7 and they have drill coming up that weekend, and they're short-staffed, or somebody's taking leave and it's gone. Or you're involved in FRGs, or you're right. involved in, I would say that. Right, or somebody could have, you know, if you're dealing with a, a, a spouse who has like PTSD, they might have had a PTSD episode that night before you had to go to work, and you're up, you know, making sure they're okay and whatnot. And I found it very shocking that there weren't managers, because I've had that problem. I've worked with people, they just don't get it. They come to work late, and that's it. They're, and they, you try to explain to them, which type of you shouldn't have to, but you know, you try to explain, and there is no like empathy with I that. I would say it it depends. I mean, my with the contractor position that I had, the overall boss was absolutely amazing. He was over colonel and he was the most amazing person that I've ever worked with, worked for, well, not the most, because the one that I work for now is actually really amazing as well. Um, yeah. But but he was great. But the contractor lead on our contract was the most horrific person I think I've ever met in my entire life. Right. Like he, was, he, was, he was just inherently a horrible person. And so he would... He would mess with me on things yeah. like, you know, like I, I didn't show up late very often, but um, if I was two minutes late walking through the door, mm -hmm. it was just like, well, what are you, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? Why are you, yeah. you know? And and so, so maybe a little bit of leniency as far as that's concerned. But the thing is, is that I don't feel like it's any more or less than any other. And then as a spouse of any other person who has like a person who works in corporate America and he's coming home after a late night deal, right. coming home late. Now I will say this job that I have now, my boss is a military, she's dual military. Mm -hmm. She is in the military herself and so is her husband and so she is a spouse as well as a soldier. And I will say she is the most empathetic, wonderful, That's amazing great. human being I think I have ever met. Because I hate it when they tell life. us like, Oh, you can't have she your phone on you. And no, I'm like, she, wait a minute. Yeah. I have a person that's in the military, and I need to have my phone on me. If you don't want it on ring, I get it. I can put it on vibrate. However, if something happens and I get a phone call, and I can't pick up that phone, but I would say that there's... I don't understand that. I would say that there's certain... Um, when they're, and I don't know because I haven't been, like, my husband 
deploy before we met. Yeah, we're um, going to talk about that. I would imagine that when. So let's talk about that. You, yeah. yeah. Let's so talk about a story deployment. of deployment. So all of our spouses here have deployed, but all of us met our spouses after deployment. <laughs> so we can't really answer any of your questions about, oh, how is it with through deployment? We don't know. <laughs> so we can ask. We can answer some things about how it is, you know, survival tips after deployment, and we'll get into that. So I will let um, Erica tell her story. So um, your husband was deployed to. So my husband was deployed to Kunar Province, and um, which, from what I understand, obviously I work there. Um, he it was a pretty rough area. Um, it was very remote. Um, it was very not not very populated um and they they saw a lot they saw a lot of a lot of action that's the best right way right to describe it um and, and so and, and so in coming in so in coming back um i didn't know him prior to leaving so i don't know i can't tell you what the difference in him was prior to leaving and prior to coming back um but i will say that there were certain things that bothered him um Apparently, the AK-7, which is what the enemy 47. uses, AK-47. I'm sorry, <laughs> AK-47 is what the enemy uses. has a very has a clapping sound, and so um, the sound of like clap, 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 clap um, bothers him. But the sound of an M16, which is what we use, um, doesn't bother him because it's a friendly, friendly sound. Um, you know, you're safe when you hear that sound because it means that those people are on your side. Um, so, and then. But, and then we talked about like, movies and such, and movies don't tend to bother him, but there were two movies made about his deployment, and so therefore those ones kind of, I, I would say, he gets a little bit more like, kind of stern face when he watches them. <laughs> um, the other thing that bothers him, that bothered him when he first came back were crowds. He was not a fan of crowds, but he was also in a very remote area where there weren't a lot, where there weren't any street lights, where there weren't any, so like crowds were like, kind of weird to him. Um, and he was there for, over a year, I can't remember. I can't remember okay. how. He was there for a much longer than he was actually supposed to be there. Um, and uh, the other thing that bothered him, which I'm starting to see a lot more signs, which is awesome, on Fourth of July, he came back around Fourth of July, and kids did fireworks in his driveway, like popping in his driveway, and um, with him and his roommate at the time, and. That to me was like one of the most insensitive things that I think I've ever like. Yeah, people. Think. I wasn't. I didn't really have that much affiliation with the military prior to marrying my husband, so I don't really know. I didn't know about PTSD. I didn't know about all the different things. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have to know that doing fireworks in someone who's just gotten back from war, this driveway is not a good thing. Right. So, yeah. Um, which you know, it's Fourth of July, so fireworks are happening, but. If you do see those signs that a veteran was here, it very well could be that they just got back two, three weeks before. Um, and it doesn't mean don't celebrate, but it also means remember um, remember the sacrifice and remember the reason why you're able right. to celebrate yeah. Fourth of July. And true. it very well could be that person that you're doing fireworks with. Very true. Life. And how, uh, how many years had your husband been in the military when you met him? Um, he had been in, oh gosh. So he graduated from, so three years? He graduated from West Point in 2009. He was there in 2004. Okay, and, and so how, how long has he been in now? So he's been in 10, I think it's officially 10 years. 10 years mm -hmm. now. Okay, I'm yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Your yes. husband also is a West no, Point. No, 10, 11 years because it's 2000. Yeah. No, it's 10 years. No, it's 10 years. 10 years. We can do that. Not my strength. <laughs> So now, Larry, so both of your husbands actually graduated from the United States Military Academy. We say West Point a lot, but we really shouldn't say it because it's called the United States Military Academy. It's at located West at West Point. <laughs> so they're both graduates. So you met your husband after as well. Yes. And he had been deployed, and he went where? So he spent 15 months in Kuwait and spent another nine months in Qatar. And how long had he been in the military when you met him? Um, so let's see, we met in 2013, he graduated in 2010, so he'd been active duty for like four years. Okay, right around that time. Um, so yeah, he, he deployed immediately after uh, graduating.
year, I guess, one after he got back. My husband didn't know. Like now that he, right? yeah, now that like either either through like working with working with other officers or other soldiers now, like they tell me certain things, and I'm like, oh, really? That's cool, honey. Did you know about X Y Z? Like sometimes they don't even know certain things, or they don't even know to ask certain things. Isn't it true? Like it's like true. when you're still it's when you're still like young and lieutenants, like they still don't know don't what know to what ask. But now as a senior captain, they're like, oh yeah, when well, we PCS you X Y da 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 da, because they've only yes one time yeah right time. <laughs> so they act like they're pros but sometimes they don't they're not know. well it's yeah. funny too when you think about it you know so my husband he spent you know 15 years at his mom's house and then where he lived in the same right. house his entire life told him what to do oh, it told him what to do he never had a real job like and then yeah. he comes off and he goes to west point and he's told him here what to do. <laughs>
Um, just and a little backstory. Go ahead. I was going to say, and a lot of times they're not going to talk to you about their war experience. That is not something that they do. Not because they don't love you, not because they feel like they would scare you or they feel like they'd never be able to play again without you freaking out. It's because you don't get it. And, and I'm perfectly okay with saying you don't get it. If you haven't been there before, you don't get it. No matter, you can't, mm -hmm. I, I, I know there's some spouses like, well, I can understand. You can understand, you can, you can think you can understand, but you, you don't. don't. And, and, the, and it's perfectly okay to say, I don't understand like what you're thinking and what you're going through, mm -hmm. but I saw your buddies online and he's in town, why don't you guys go have a beer? Right. And, they, and if, even if you have to set it up so that they go hang out with each other, because guys are weird about hanging out with each other. Girls will be like, oh my god, I hang out all the time. <laughs> but guys, guys, you almost have to be like, here's a friend and you're a friend, why don't you? And, and, and like right. someone that they've deployed with, mm -hmm. um, was there, they get it. There are certain things that they can be like, yeah, man, remember when we were, yeah. And that's yeah. all they need to say. And they both understand exactly what they're trying to say right at that moment, but you'll never be on that level. You'll never be there. That'll never be you. But he needs those, he or she needs yeah. those relationships mm -hmm. um, in order to uh, be able to kind of decompress a little bit. I yeah. Say. yeah. There's a brotherhood that there is created. a brotherhood. By those in, by those soldiers in those those small units, especially you know like your husband when they were out there in the middle of nowhere, there is a there is a camaraderie that that we as spouses just will we never understand. That. And it's a right to say, and that's okay. Yeah, that's it's not our totally place. Right. That's not our job. That is not a part of of your spouse's life that you need to be in control of. It is your job to maintain here so that when they come home. They don't have to worry about things at home. It is always your job to help them relax when they're home and when they're away. And, and I know how that sounds. Like even to me, I'm like, oh god, this is all nineteen <laughs> <laughs> seventies. <laughs> the new sort of way to look at it is that it's not like, oh, I'm vacuuming in pearls. Hey, honey, what is, what's going on over no, there? It is. It's not that. It's I'm taking care of everything so that when you're over there, you're worried about, you know, the enemy and how we're going to defeat the enemy. And right. that is the only thing that you're worried about because you don't need to worry about whether or not your bills are going to get paid or if your house is getting foreclosed on or whatever is happening at home. I've got that handled. I've got the muscle movement at home. You've got the muscle movement out of the field. Let's right. do this together because we're a team. Right. Yes, exactly. You now, are a team. my thing is different. <laughs> um, because my wife has been in the military so long, she is at that point where she actually has opened up and told me stories about what happened to her while she was deployed. So um, my wife was deployed twice. Uh, the first uh, deployment was to Kosovo. That was her very first deployment. And that was a very hard deployment for her. Um, that had to deal with a lot of genocide, with a lot of uh, children and women. And the second one is Afghanistan. That one wasn't as bad, but the very first one was the one that was horrible for her. So she has actually shared stories with me. So now I can understand, like, now when we go out, whereas before, if she didn't ex share those stories with me, I probably would have been like, well, I don't understand. Um, like like you were saying, there's certain things that you have to be mindful of as a spouse that your spouse um, or soldier um, will not necessarily get, find as fun like we do. Like I love haunted houses. My wife uh -uh, will <laughs> not happen. She will go with me and wait outside. She'll she be you know, to with you but wait right outside. <laughs> try it and she had to stop in the middle of it and it was a flashback and that was it like and I understood I supported her we left right um, you have to be mindful of that you know don't give them grief please don't give them a hard time they're not trying to like be downers or not be there for you we don't understand what they went through 
and so we need to be supportive as spouses and understand that, okay? If you don't like crowds, and I get it, I'm very butterfly out there, okay? <laughs> but as I'm getting older, to be honest with you, I'm noticing I don't really like crowds anymore right. either. <laughs> I kind of like, I, I don't want people today. <laughs> and that's just me with age. So I'm like, oh, it's okay, babe. Sorry. Stay in the house. It's all good. You know? Um, so there's certain things that you'll you'll notice, okay? Um, also, understand that after deployment, their rank is probably going to start going up. So with rank comes more responsibility. So if you thought that they were busy before <laughs> their deployment or whatnot, when they come back and their rank starts going up, um, they're about to step up their game, okay? And they will. Um, they, yeah. they will not tell you that. They will tell you, well, after I'm, I don't know about, I, I don't know about all of them. I don't know if everyone's like this, but my husband was like, oh, yeah, well, after I'm out of company command, then, then I'll have more time to do X, Y, Z. And, well, after I'm out of grad school, then we'll have more time to do X, Y, Z. No, well, after I'm the, it's and, all and it's like, really, guys? So you think you're going to get more rank? And less responsibility, and you're gonna have more time. We're gonna have more time to play and have a good. I'm like, okay, reality check. No, that's not gonna happen. But at the same time, uh -huh. sometimes you have to help them say, okay, like, yes, you're on call 24/7 because that's what the military is. But if you know their schedule very fairly well, and you know that there's a time where yes, they could be working, but they could also use a breather. It's okay to me to say, we're gonna take a break. And I've scheduled this, so we're gonna do. You know, right. what I mean? unless it's like something where like his commander is like, no, you have to do something. But sometimes they need that, like, you know, girls always want to be the one where it's just like, hey, girl, I got you a, you know, a, a, a restaurant reservation, and I got your dress all picked out. Like we want that, but sometimes they're the ones that need us to be like, I made a reservation. We're going at this time, yes. this time, yes. and you have to be there, and you, this is what you're wearing. Because the main thing about being in the military is that you never know, they never know what to wear because they always wear uniforms all the time. Yes. So they always are so silly <laughs> to not oh even get my God. Sorry, I'm so there.
army looks at it and goes, throw a captain on it, we'll be good. <laughs> oh my it God. doesn't matter, just yeah. throw a captain on it, throw a captain on it, we'll see if it works. <laughs> oh my goodness, that is so funny. But AGR is a great program, like I said, because Sorry. it's such a close family, and they don't have to PSC, and they're not PSCing every 13 months, so I just got to throw that out there. Um, one of the other things that I've noticed as a spouse, <clears throat> because I live off post, you live off post. I do. So um, you live on post, and so your husband, you know, probably goes into, uh, he works on post, right? So he probably goes um, to work in his uniform, yeah. right? Well, um, actually, no. So he typically goes to work in civilian clothes, and okay. then he changes it. So, oh, wow. But not mine. But that's so, a, but that's how you guys about that. Thing. Yeah, that's 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 yeah, that's a less point. Because because mm -hmm. most posts, you'll you'll notice that most of the time your um, spouse will be in oh, what they call OCPs, which is which are the boots with the camouflage. Um, at, they call them pillow jeans. <laughs> at West Point, they wear a lot of ASUBs. Almost every single day, they wear ASUBs, which is the um, white shirt. And that white shirt gets really really dirty and really really stinky. So if they're walking to work or if they're in their car and it's getting all crinkled up or rumpled crumpled up and you have to wear ASUBs every single day. Um, I think there's two days out of the week that you don't have to wear them. Um, ASUBs. Is that right? Um, ASUBs. Right? ASUBs. The camouflage or the no, no, no. no. Oh, wait. ASUBs are the white shirt. The white oh, wait. The white shirt. Which one was it? OCPs. Um, OCPs. Right. So it's a, it, what I'm trying to say is that it's ACUs. That's it. Yeah. I'm all like, wait a minute. Yeah, OCPs are okay. Okay. OCPs every place. Listen, I'm old school. I still know my ACUs. Yeah. Especially yeah. Like the back with the pinks and greens. Those so, are oh, yeah. Those are coming. Those are coming. <laughs> oh, and that's the other thing, too, is that they'll spend a lot of money on uniforms. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. I don't want to tell you yeah. how so much, much stuff is in our store shed yeah. right now. And the uniforms constantly change. Yes. Oh, my goodness. So you constantly have to buy new things. And they're not cheap. But no. As, no. a, as enlisted officers, so they get a stipend to buy new uniforms, I think it's each year. Um, but officers, commissioned officers, will have to pay all of that stuff out of pocket and that joint is expensive. It's expensive. So. so basically my wife is not is not a West Point graduate, not affiliated. So she does go to work uh, wearing her ACUs. And I will tell you this, that um, for me, when I first became um, her girlfriend, I was very petrified of her having going to work in uniform. Because oftentimes she would have to stop at a gas station or would go and get groceries after work and whatnot and would still be in their uniform. You'll see that. If you live in a military community off post, which I do, okay, I see people in their uniform all the time, Dunkin' Donuts, this and that. Now, we forget that there are people there that are not fond of the military. So I have had my wife be spit on, and I've also had my wife have a grocery cart for her and have had her thanked for her service. So these are things that I have to deal with as a spouse constantly in the back of my mind, which goes back to the same thing as wanting to have my phone on me. Uh, because in case anything happens, you know, I've gotten that phone call where, yeah, they just got spit on, and, you know, okay, so and so, you know, the manager came over, or whatever, and then I had the great phone calls where, oh, okay, we've never guessed what just happened. And, like super humble and like, oh my goodness, I can't believe. Do you that. find that your spouses have difficulty when someone says thank you for your service? Yes, they, they they get really weird about thank you for your not because they don't like it, it's because they don't know what to say back. Like thank you for your service, well, thank you for thanking me. <laughs> yeah. So that, so, yeah. What we, so what I've heard somebody say, and I brought it home to my husband is. They say thank you for your service. You say thank you for your support. Mm -hmm. And it's a, yeah, and it's a good way. It's a good way to. So share that with your spouses if they if they do that whole awkward thank you for thanking me for thanking. Like <laughs> and, and it does. They do it all the time. And they and a lot of my husband won't like wear a uniform anywhere because he, he hates it. I mean, not that he hates that, that being thanked. He hates the awkwardness of. I don't know what to say to that. Yeah, yeah, I don't really know what to say. But say. thank you for your support. Is it because you'll get as a spouse, you'll get thanks for your service as well. well. Yes. Yep. And it's and a, a good response is thank you for your support. Absolutely. Um, just also know that you're gonna have to schedule a lot of your <clears throat> stuff around their schedule. Yes. Okay. Um, I have to schedule a lot of things around her drill time. I guess she drills once a month. Okay. And so I'm like, okay, if I really want to make a trip or whatnot, and I also have to be mindful that they only get a certain amount of leave time, mm -hmm. okay? 
Um, so it depends on how much lead time that they have accumulated and how much they're allowed to take. If there's anything going on in that month that's very important, that and their their commander might be like, nope, sorry, okay, you have two weeks that you can use, but because there's something important going on this month, I'm only going to be able to give you a week or whatnot. So it's very important to just be patient, <laughs> be understanding that you will have to schedule things around their schedule. It just happens, and don't you know, said if things change, and you get a phone call the night before because it happens. Nothing things change is set all in stone. No. Nothing is Not even stuff. if they say they're coming, they come home and they say, hey, we're moving to X, Y, Z. You're nothing. probably not, actually. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, you're probably not. <laughs> nothing no, set in stone nothing until you get the orders. Yeah, yeah, yeah set don't set set. And even if you get the order sometimes, those will change. Not you too. But sure, but that, it's, it's a little harder it's to little, change. It's a little harder to change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, for me, I want to talk about retirement. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so there's wonderful things, and then there's also stressful things. Because I'm at that point where if you are a military spouse and your spouse has been in the military and they're about to be retired, um, don't feel like you're um, by yourself in this, okay? We want to be excited inside because I'm super excited and she knows it. <laughs> and she's super excited, but then at the same time, I also have to be understanding that her excitement isn't going to be on the same level as mine and it's going to come and go. Because you have to understand, they have been in that uniform pretty much, she's been in since she was 19, mm -hmm. okay? Um, that's her job, that's what she knows. So having to go back into the civilian world and to go back to trying to get a civilian job, because eventually she will go back to work even though she can retire for whatever reason, we just need to do that as humans, we retire and then we get bored because we're so used to working, right? That's not weird. Yeah. Tell you. So, um, I talked to her about it, like, oh, well, how do you feel? And you, for me, um, which I've heard this a lot, is you will hear them say, you know, I'm not ready to not be a soldier anymore. And my, my reply to that, and what I encourage you to tell them, is something very positive. And my response to that was, you know what, um, a uniform doesn't um, doesn't define you as a soldier. You will always be a soldier, in here. and that's what I tell her. You'll always be a soldier, no matter what, even if you don't have that uniform. And um, I noticed a difference with her, the thinking, like oh, you know. So for us, after retirement, because we haven't bought a house, none of that, and. We normally don't really when you're in the military. We did. We did it. I we did. I did not go. Like, no. We bought a house here. I'm like, no, I'm not ready because yeah. I don't want to stay here. And just so you guys know, because I'm not sure who all is watching the video, we are all in New York right now. Um, but uh, I don't want to stay here. She don't want to stay here. It's not our cup of tea. Um, we really want to move overseas. That's like our goal. And that's why I haven't bought a house or anything like that, or furniture or anything like that. So there's things that, as a spouse, that um, you might have to put aside or wait, right, until it's that time. And for us, it's getting a home and starting a family. Speaking of starting a family, <laughs> okay, we'll say nothing. Eventually. <laughs> okay, so to end it, we wanted to end it on some very funny things, which is some fun facts. So one of the things is we get told some funny stories. I don't know about you guys, but my wife's told me some pretty funny stories. And a lot of them have to do with her stories about basic training. And one of the questions I asked her actually the other day was, I was like, what if you guys have a poop? <laughs> no joke, you got a poop. You find a poop hole. <laughs> like, what, do you have to, what, do you have to, what if you have to poop? And you're in basic training. She's like, babe, you have to hold it. And I was like, nah, man. I'm like, wait, first of all, if you're not used to eating that kind of food that they give you, your stomach is not going to process that food very well to begin with. So you know you got some diarrhea. <laughs> and I was like, you know when you have diarrhea, you can't go, you can't hold it. Yeah. And I was like, what do you do? She goes, you just let it run down your leg and you kick yourself. I'm not kidding. I was like, oh my God, have you ever done this? She goes, no. She goes, it didn't happen to me. She goes, but I have had a soldier friend of mine, it happened that person and 
then eventually they had to go to the bathroom and they were in there for like 30 minutes and they had to clean themselves or whatever. So <laughs> I found out because she did say that a lot of people can't poop. They get stuffed up because of the food and everything and they can't poop. And um, sometimes they can't poop for a couple days. So there is a gum that is given to you in basic training and you're like, ooh, gum, yay. It's actually to help you poop. So there you go. Mm -hmm. And if you do have to poop and you're in the field, okay, I did hear this story, that they only, you only get like max like 10 minutes to poop, okay? <laughs> But I told her, I was like, but what if you're a woman and, like, you have your menstrual? They don't give a damn, she mm -hmm. said. They don't care. You better plug it up or find something. <laughs> and she said yep. there was one person at her um, at recent training, and they were in there for more than 10 minutes. And they literally, because if you, there are certain things that you do in ba basic training. And one of them um, was, like, the gas chamber or whatever, right? Yep. So if you, if there's a thing in basic training that you pass and they know, okay, that person's going to be fine, they will mess with you, okay? So she said that the person was in there for like 10 minutes, and I guess it was the uh, drill sergeant or whatever, <laughs> popped it right underneath the porta potty, oh, wow. and that person had to come running out because wow. they'd already passed the gas chamber That's so they knew so they'd funny. be okay. Oh. And he said, I told you, no more than 10 minutes. That's I was so like, funny. what if you come out with your pants? Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm finished.